Welcome everyone. I hope you are have all found your seats and are ready for today. I'm glad you tuned in and I'm glad you're here to uh, hear more about curbside management. Um, first, I want you to know this session is being recorded. Link to the public sessions will be sent out afterwards, so don't worry about that part. Um, then, uh, my name is Julie Schack. I'm a transport planner at WSP Sweden, and we are partners of the EU project of Reveal, um, which I'll come back to in just a moment. Uh, but first, I'd like to present to you the speaker of this session, Pierre Solier. Pierre, will you uh, give a brief introduction to yourself? Yes, hello everyone. I'm also a transport planner at WSP. I'm, I'm situated here in, in Malmö in our office. And I have been have the fortune to to really go in deep in this topic today, and I will give the speech here now, starting from now and going on about approximately forty minutes. Thank you, Per. So um, then I'll just give a brief introduction to the reason why we've gathered you here today, and that is because of the Reveal project. Reveal stands for Regulating Vehicle Access for Improved Livability. And with this prolonged title might give you a little bit of a hint into what this project is about. Um, but the mission is to enable cities to optimize urban space um, and the usage of their um, transport networks um, through urban vehicle access policies and technologies. But that's while that's the mission, the goal in all, overall is to shift towards more sustainable transport habits, lead, leading to fewer emissions, less noise, and improve accessibility and quality of life. So that's the overall goal and mission of the Reveal project. Then we uh, have a partnership, or we are different partners in this, where WSP Sweden is also part of it. Um, we have the cities that I'll come back to in a minute, and then we have different um, different partners that are working on this. Um, we have the cities that are part of this. It will be, we have the city of London in the UK, then we have Bielefeld in Germany, Helmond in the Netherlands, Padua in Italy, Vittoria Gasteiz in Spain, and also Jerusalem in Israel. And all of these cities are, um, working on projects um, within the Reveal project. And what we're doing here is all of these cities are, be, are developing uh, and implementing and testing measures of urban vehicle access regulation. And, um, and these urban vehicle access regulations, also known as UBARs, uh, are what we're working with within the project. And the reason we're working with this is to reduce urban congestion to reduce emissions, increase safety, uh, and increase the in attractiveness of the urban areas. And then also because carrots aren't enough, and um, and although carrots can be delightful, we also have to work with a carrot and a stick approach to uh, get any of these measures to work. Um, so to achieve fewer uh, cars in our cities, we simply need to complement with some level of restrictions. And this project then focuses on these restrictions and how to make them work for each of these six cities that we are working with. Um, here you have a little bit of an example of what a UVAR can be. So it can be anything from congestion charges, parking restrictions, low emission zones, zero emission zones, circulation plans, and anything basically that limits traffic through the city center. It can be in a physical way with bollards or planters, but it can also be through camera enforcing and fines in that way. Um, so that is part of what the Reveal project is working on. This is actually not part of the main part. Um, if you want to know more about the Reveal project, it can be followed on civitas-reveal.eu. Feel free to go in and uh, get to know more if you feel like it. Uh, for now, it was just a short uh, introduction to let you know why we've sort of set this uh, workshop and uh, webinar up. Um, and therefore, I would like to give uh, the presentation to Per, who will come and give you the um, introductory session that you have all come here to see the plenary se session and the introduction to dynamic curbside management. So I will just give here the sharing ability. Let us see how we do that. 
Mm -hmm. Ped, you have now been given. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. And I should be in present mode here as well. Yes. So the focus of my presentation today and the, and the, the workshop webinar uh, we have today is to identify barriers to implementing dynamic curbside management. And I will I will have five parts here in, in my presentation. First, I will give, just give the uh, introduction to what uh, we are supposed to set out to do uh, regards of uh, dynamic curbside management in, in wheel. And then 10 aspects of curb use mismanagement an introduction and explanation of what we see as what is dynamic curbside management. Um, and then um, what we have identified as barriers. And uh, this is a work in progress. And that's important to, to notice uh, that we are still working on this. And the, the, the day and the sessions we have today and the feedback we get from you and uh, tuning in here is important for us also. This is what we should include uh, later in our in our report and our work. And then the last point here, the last bullet point, ways to overcome those barriers. Okay, so dynamic curbside management uh, is the, here is the, the like the formal uh, phrasing in, in our project plan is to to prepare, set up and carry a so-called sandbox, which is another word from the from computer science for a trial pilot. And we should also we're set up to you have an advanced Uber approach. Um, and we are supposed to do this in the area of the Eastern cluster in the city of London, the, this so-called square mile. And we are also set up to use cutting edge technology and tools. So that, that's our objective. And for doing this, we have two steps. Step one, and this is what we're doing right now, is to map and understand the present both understand both present and future needs of different types of curbside demands, both general um, globally and then specific to the chosen location in London. And this is what we're doing now in, to, to identify and understand barriers for future implementation. And, and for that, we also have this international workshop. And together, as I said before, this is supposed to be, uh, to, uh, we're supposed to compile a report on barriers, which will uh, be, be issued in, in end of November. And step two then is to, to go in detail and, and develop a concrete sandbox plan uh, in within this area in London in collaboration between us, the city of London and Transport for London. And there will also be a final report where we will update our findings from step one, with what we are takeaways from, from the step two. Okay. I will give you some aspects of curb use mismanagement so you, so you get an idea of if we don't work with this, what, what can happen and what will happen. Um, the first aspect, which is, I would say, the most important is the use needs. And the, that is saying that the misbehavior of street users are often an indicator of mismanagement. And we can, for example, see a correlation between if you have a loading by shortage and, and the number of violations and citations on street. And it's always, it, it, this also includes that we always need to anticipate the unintended, the unwanted, and try to address and mitigate it. I mean, if we, for example, implement a bike path and then we decide to remove parking space in a loaded space, um, you should have, of course, the approach that you will have to address the question what happens with all these need, user needs when we take this away. Next aspect is traffic flow and congestion. And I mean, if, if you double park in a street, that of course uh, lowers the level of service in the street. And we also know that a small number of disturbers in, in key streets can have a system wide effect. Um, and we also know that vehicles cruising for, for, for curb access can also amount for a substantial number of the traffic in a specific street. I think you all heard of, of Donald Shoup and his works and saying that like over 30% in a specific street in, in specific times can actually be attributed to, to search traffic and cruising. Emissions, of course. Uh, I mean, if you go around more, if there's an increase in vehicle kilometers traveled and idling motor vehicles um, that cause both local air quality problems and, of course, also CO2 emissions. We have the aspect of prior to lane, priority lane performance. This is, is com as a common problem that if you introduce bus, bus lanes, for example, then stopping for dropping off both people and goods uh, is a clear risk that would also deteriorate the effectiveness of the measure if you try to implement. And also could, could impact the, the mode choices of that people, people choose. 
traffic safety. This is a picture of which most people wouldn't think about uh, when you hear traffic safety from the beginning, you would th th think about something else. But this is a, a state-of-the-art uh, bike path in Stockholm, inaugurated a few years ago, one of the widest ones there is, and which also, unfortunately, functions as, as a queuing area for food trucks. Or functioned, because they have actually done something about this. Uh, this is also traffic safety, but I would like to highlight the, the aspect of security here. I mean, this is a picture from to the, from the left. There's a picture from New York, uh, where you see what's happened. They have a, a loading um, loading in packages uh, to the local McDonald's, and then as a bike as a bicyclist, you have to swivel out in in the moving traffic lane. And the same to the right from, from Stockholm, uh, from from a cab uh, just standing in the bike lane. Another aspect is emergency access, and this is also a picture from, from New York, one of the busiest streets there is. Uh, a lot of pedestrians, the pedestrians, the capacity of, of the pavement sidewalk is, is not enough. Clearly, people are walking in the moving lane, especially have this bunching when you have a, a, a stopping up for red light at a, at a crosswalk. Um, you get these scenes. And I mean, there are a lot, a lot of aspects, other aspects as well here, traffic safety being one. Um, Traffic flow could just another one. Emergency access is the one I've chosen here. Accessibility uh, is, is a big one. I mean, uh, there are a number of countries where it's uh, actually not illegal per se to to uh, park on a pavement sidewalk, um, which of course is really really strange for me in Sweden. But I mean, on the other hand, to the right we have a, a common scene in Sweden. Though this picture is from Copenhagen. It's what what we choose to 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 use our payments and sidewalks for, and and they get a lot of a number of purpose access accessibility being one. Another aspect is livability. I mean, in, in the way we use our space in the streets and curbs uh, also affects uh, what we get, of course. Uh, and here is the example of of uh, a FedEx operator uh, just sorting uh, his. The, the packages on street and on the pavement. And there's the other end of that uh, aspect is, well, what happens with all this, uh, with all this trash, trash and waste? And you see this lonely tree in the middle there trying to, to survive. And the last one, urban space is an asset. I mean, this is a car in Rome being parked maybe for a bit too long. And, and just signals the question, what do we want to use our curb space and cities for? Maybe not storage of long time, long time storage for, for vehicles. Yes, and I will go over to introduction, introduction introduce the, the, the topic and, and try to define what it is. And if I want you to, to um, understand or take something with you, what I'm trying to say here today is that curbside management is, first of all, a strategic and holistic approach for an effective use of the urban street space. And it's, it's a, I mean, it's for someone, it, some some people would maybe be something new. Maybe you would feel like this is a buzzword for me. And first also it's kind of a buzzword, but it's about doing what you already do, but in a more structured and efficient way. And this, Doing this supports the move towards sustainable transport system and livable cities. And it also stresses the need for better digitized and open data. That is, you have to collaborate and you have to have a transparent prioritization and decision making model because otherwise you can't do this. And this fits very nice into the to the overall picture of and and, and objectives of the reveal project. And then we move on to to try to propose a definition of dynamic curbside management. And I would I would explain later here where we get <laughs> why we choose these words and wordings but the definition is as follows um, the management of curb adjacent space according to the time varying need and demand of different users and users and i'll underline time varying here because that's a key to to also to the, the prefix of dynamic here and what we've done so far is uh, a literature study where we have scanned both cities policy documents uh, gray literature with reports from such as like NGOs, consultative firms as WSP, we are one, um, but, and also from solution and technology providers, and lastly, academic articles and papers. And as I said earlier, this work will result in a report due end of November, which also then will include the findings and, and the feedback from the sessions today. 
And when going through these three types of documents, we have found that we can describe them, each one of them, with their main respective characteristics. And um, and and but there also is one common denominator is that most of these documents are written in America or from an American perspective. And of the reason for that, of course, being that um, that is where that's where the rise of ride services and deliveries has been more dramatic or or, or have happened over a longer period of time, giving cities there more time to respond. That's what we think, at least. And then the, the main focus in policy documents, which we have found, is to focus on, on space management. Specifically moving from, from uh, moving traffic or parking to other functions. And I will go through these other functions later. And the secondary focus here, which we found, is regulation, enforcement, and, and data. And this is, by the way, a picture from the San Francisco MTA's curb management strategy, which was released now in February this year. Gray literature typically focuses on on and, and, and calls for cities to start working with the topic in a structured way. We see the words of collaboration, technology, the possible solution tools, platforms, most of it mostly reflecting the needs and the ambitions of the author or uh, the client of the report. And these actors could be uh, actors like they want to market their expertise, they want to market their solutions or technology. And they, they of course, in part highlight their needs for example, for more dedicated space for pick up and drop off of people as the picture here of the Uber drop off zone. Um, and that's, that's maybe one uh, USP for what we're doing here. I mean, we're trying to have a city perspective and a, a end user perspective. And I, we, we, we would say that this hasn't been done before in, in, in together. Lastly, academic articles and papers. And the main part of this uh, literature focuses on occupancy and availability, and mostly in connection with, with parking. And this includes sensing technologies, uh, demand responsive pricing, um, or dynamic pricing as well, another word. And they name a, a, a range of potential effects. Um, mostly these effects are from, from some sort of modeling and often these models try to reach uh, some kind of system optimum and their effects uh, the claimed effects uh, could be such as reduced cruising search traffic congestion well these aspects which i started my presentation with um, and then only a handful of, of articles describe and evaluate physical trials and pilots of some some sort of the mobility aspects of cursor management and, and in most cases, when, when we have these articles, they, the artists actually evaluate their own work. So that could potentially be a, a one first barrier, a, a lack of academic uh, literature from, from physical trials. Uh, physical trials. And, and this is, of course, that, that there has been <laughs> quite a few number of physical trials, maybe, or at least in, 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 in the respect of curbside management. And this has led us to to uh, compile this picture. Um, I know which gives you an overview of what we like to include in curbside management. And in the dark green here, not the darkest one, but there there are five functions. And starting from the bottom, we have storage for vehicles, parking, you could say. You have access for goods and access for people. These are the mobility aspects of curbside management mostly there are some elements of mobility also in public space and services for example i mean if you have um, if you look at accessibility and you want the public benches for people who are with the impairments yeah but this the one the three ones in the bottom is what we focus on here in, in reveal but we all we do this as julie introduced here also to have livable and healthy cities so what we do here it could also be a way to facilitate the top two ones, which is public space and services and, and retail activities. And in retail also include, include restaurants. And public space could be such things like, as I said, benches, trees, rain gardens, something that adds a value to the street as well. 
And the important part in curbside management is to move away from just management different functions as parking management to managing the space, the space the curb access. Uh, I mean, when we do this, we have the lens of mobility, but curbside management could potentially and should maybe equally be seen as something that belongs in such, field, such fields as urban design, economics, cultural geography, or maybe natural resources. But that's what we, we are. That's our starting point, at least. And why we have why we have this perspective could one reason for this could be that we as urban mobility planners we most often control the day-to-day -day operations of the streets. For example, we can say that well, transit should have the right of way. Okay, everyone everyone else stand aside. And we also control often we often control um, ordinances and revenue streams for, from parking and purpose, and that gives gives us leverage, I think, in in, in relation to other functions and other areas and fields. The precondition for these patrons are, of course, um, and and also what affects affects the needs for different functions are, I would say, three things: land use policies and planning the transportation system in the city or the region, and the local transportation options. And, and that included both for, for, for people and goods. And within those fields, there are, of course, a number of measures that you also have a strong interrelationship with curbside management, which we do not include, but it heavily influences the needs for different functions. It's, it's, to name a few, off-street parking, off-street loading, if you want to have delivery time windows, and consolidation centers. If we're speaking reveal um, terminology, we call these uh, complementary measures. Okay, moving into what we have identified as barriers from our literature study. And a reminder here, this is what we what we found, and we want your feedback on this. So you could uh, you could you could feel free to send your comments um, also here because uh, Julie will try to help me to compile them and see if we can do, go through them afterwards. I would start uh, to explain uh, how we've done this. We we are, have set out to structure our findings uh, both regarding barriers and possible solutions using the the Ruvil transition area framework. And this framework is developed to support our understanding of how change processes and new methods. Message, message, measures are managed in cities. And from the left to right, we have governance and financing, which includes legal, political, pr procedural issues, and financing mechanisms. And then we have user needs and public acceptance, uh, which includes demands, needs, act acceptance of regulation, willingness to pay, etc. Next one is system design technology, which is uh, data driven planning, smart enforcement systems, connected travel, etc. And the last one, and this is uh, what we, in respect of curbside management, mostly see to related to uh, to what we need to manage, not really related to how we many things manage the curb. So we actually left that one out. You can protest if you like, and and if you if you have a, another view on that. And if you want more information about the four transition areas, there is a, a, a nice webinar which was broadcasted in, in May, 26th of May, and I will include it in my presentation here later, which you can circulate. And you will also find it on, on our website, the, the, the Reveal website. Okay. Uh, within governance and financing, I, we have identified two categories. The first one is organization and resources, and the other one is regulation. And going through them short, uh, one by one is that the first one is silo organization. This is of course a common thing and it's something that's easy to say and harder to do something about. And it means of course that, that, that the responsibilities for different one of the different functions, which we, we saw earlier, um, are divided, usually divided among different agencies internally. Staffing is a problem. I mean, and, and the bandwidth of the, of this of the staff. Uh, there's only so many things that you in a city can attend to, and there's generally no one having a lot of free time. You're sitting around. Okay, let's work with curbside management. So that could also potentially be a barrier. 
And lastly, I've written shifting revenue streams. There's a, some literature on, on highlighting that saying that we have to uh, mitigate the, the, the decline in revenues if we shift from parking to, to other functions. So at first, you will probably see a, de a decline, but, and you will have criticism for that for the, because you're lowering, lowering the revenues. But I, I will still keep with shifting revenue streams because that's really what it is. If you, for example, if I, uh, extend an open air dining, you will have um, maybe a lease um, as an income, and you will probably have um, higher sales taxes um, and maybe even a, 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 some kind of harder to um, estimate value for for a, a nicer urban urban street. Regulation, moving into that. And the first one is legisla legislation. And that's what the sign tries to indicate here as well, that you may want to do something about your legislation, the proper, how to have proper legislation in place. I mean, there's the example of e-scooters here in Sweden, which we, uh, which the municipalities and cities don't really have any legal tools to, to manage. Uh, and they're trying now, they're fighting now to get these tools in, in a legal way. Um, it also it would maybe need a, that new measures would need other ordinances and traffic orders that you maybe need to be more flexible. And that's the next point here. Uh, if you, for example, want to introduce a more dynamic approach for, for which functions can use a stretch of curb and when they can use them, you need, <laughs> need to be more flexible than like in, ma in many countries and many cities, you, you, you paint the streets one or two, line, one or two lines in yellow or, or red, meaning that you, there's no stopping. And uh, you might want to change that, or you have at least have that during a period of the day. And then the last two ones here, security and personal data protection. Introducing new measures here um, often includes some, some new bit of technology, uh, new interfaces and new systems. And you of course want to be, to be secure and to protect the identity of the the users, both the end users or in the private companies using these services and solutions. Which uh, but just nicely over to user needs. And I could have written private written private issues here as well. But the first one of course being when you introduce new tools, as the one in the picture in the right, there's like you have to use a mobile app where booking is required for access in a loading zone. There is a new interface. Do people understand how to use that one? Is it user friendly? Is it easy? Do you understand the regulation behind it? How it all interacts? We have an, an equity issue here as well. Um, setting up all these systems means that, I mean, there have seen examples of trials uh, where you only can access, access, access a loading zone uh, if you use the app or if you're a registered company who can then use this app, which blocks this piece of stretch, uh, stretch of the street uh, for everyone else. And that's also maybe linked to a, a fear of pri privatization. I mean, if you have a drop off and a pickup zone, shifting it from, from parking would be, be available for everyone. You basically shift um, a, a common good to the use, to the adapted to the, to the needs of, of players such as Uber and Lyft. And do we want to do that? Maybe yes, in some some ways, but there are issues here, of course. Personal data protection, I mentioned. And one one barrier I, we, we see also here when you use needs is that we know there are, are not much literature on, on the effects of different measures. And this, it, I think this could be a problem as well. Then public acceptance is of course always hard, always a barrier, shifting status quo. I mean, people think that what's, what's there is fine. That's the, the most uh, fair, fair way of doing stuff. Um, and, and any change to that is, is always hard. And privatization I already mentioned. Last one, system design technology. And there are barriers here for a city. If you want new solutions and new technology, if you already have existing solutions in place, and this system you often require for a longer period of time, at least you want them to be in place for a longer period of time, because there's a lot of resources connected to, to implementing them and running them. And there's also a barrier in this bullet point 
because you have or you often have different providers and system for different tasks. Example for parking, you might have one system for handling transactions, one for searching plate numbers, and another, a third one for issuing citations. And if you're lucky, maybe these ones are from the same provider. But then again, there could be that you have, uh, going back to the, the bullet point of silo organizations, you have the, the password for logging into all these portals or interfaces. It's, it's like it sits on one person in, in different uh, part of the organization. And the next one here is code in the curve um, and should maybe stay, say a, a digital inventory because uh, if we want to work smarter, be more effective, we need to have a structure and we also have to have an overview of what do we have. And if I approach, uh, if approaching many cities, asking them, okay, how many on-street parking spaces do you have? There's only a handful of them who can actually answer us. And you could get a one potentially from actually coding curb, knowing that between between here and here, we have parking, we're here we have loading with these restrictions, and here we have a fire hose or whatever, a bus stop. You have, I think you have to do that. And then next one is the lack of standards. Um, if we are supposed to do anything here, we want to do it in a proper way. And I mean, I'm not an expert in, in computer science or in building databases or whatever. I'm an urban planner, urban transport planner. So we hope often that someone else has done this in, in, in a proper way, which you just can follow on. Uh, this goes for, for, for both coding the curb, the one bullet point above, and structuring data and, and operating devices and vehicles at the curb. Last one being one of the hardest one to solve when you have everything else well sort of in place is enforcement. And if it, an effective enforcement have we have discovered for short stops, which is a big part of why we talk about curbside management, short stops for, for pick up and drop off of people or goods is hard. It's really, really hard. I mean, today uh, in the landscape, we were mostly focused on parking and loading maybe separately. Um, the ones just stopping at the curb for a few few minutes, it's not a problem. But when we have the volume of that, that's when it becomes a problem. And we can't have officers just standing on each stretch of the curb watching. And of course, you could say that, well, we could have uh, cameras or a lot of technology. Yeah, but still, there's still problems with that. And, 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 and I don't know, one of the cities who will be talking later today, San Francisco, they have tried to enforce cameras, but there's a lot, a number of issues with user needs and legislation involved with doing that. And then I know that in some countries, it's really, really hard to, to use um, cameras on street. Uh, but if you do, I mean, you can also see, you can also see that if you enforce the, 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 the lane adjacent to the curb, well, the problem might only um, only move to the moving lane outside instead. So that's hard. Okay, um, we'll move on to to possible ways to overcome these barriers. And I we have chosen to to divide this uh, this possible solution in three parts: structure and organize collect and digitize data, and lastly, collaborate and do pilots. And for structure and organize, uh, the first one being that you should identify responsibilities. Who are responsible for every bit of management relating to the curb? And typically, as I said before, this is divided upon um, different agencies inside a city, potentially also sometimes outside of the city organization. And the next step I would say would be to develop some kind of framework for prioritizing functions and needs. And, and that is also in combination with having a, street, a clear street hierarchy and, and topology. And the picture here uh, to the right is, is uh, a picture from the Horizon 2020 project called MORE. And that project is set out to develop and implement procedures for for design of urban corridor roads. So it, it's very close to what we do in Reveal, but it's also something else. And the idea of this picture is to show that we, over time, have moved away from primarily looking at the needs of car traffic in streets, then to all vehicles and all mobility in the green circle, and to, to the present 
today that we should consider streets as multifunctional places. And I think is um, could be an explanation to why we would start talking about curbside management because when moving from moving when moving from moving traffic to to places, um, that's uh, where something happens at the curb. And there are some examples, there are many examples from, from, from city policies around the globe. And I have two here, and, and the, this picture is also misspelled, but there's, there's the need to prioritize from Stockholm, which was issued in their uh, strategy in 2012. And this picture shows that if, if they want to include all functions in our typical main streets in Stockholm, we will have to be 45 meters wide. And the, the real world typical main street in Stockholm is somewhere between 20 and 30 meters wide. So, well, we have to prioritize and this is familiar to every one of us. And even though this picture mostly considers moving traffic, this is still a good starting point for us, including the needs and, and the discussion for, for curb access. The next one example, uh, next, next example is the, the, this one, the street types matrix, which was compiled by Transport for London. And of course, um, mostly it, it covers the transport for London roads within within the Greater London, uh, but also uh, affects the local streets in, in the boroughs. And this this kind of matrix or hierarchy is something that has been been developed in many cities, and many cities have some sort of hierarchy already. And but the interesting here is to also the focus on on place, which is the, what P here stands for. So that you can have have two axes here, movement and, and place, and, and that this also could guide what we are to prioritize in the streets. This is the useful framework uh, for, for discussing also the curb axis and the functions we want in the street. The next solution, so to say, is to collect and digitize data. And I know everything here sounds super easy. And I know that in the real world it's really, really hard because you who have discovered that you want to do this, maybe you don't have the leverage or you don't have the responsibility to actually say, okay, let's do this. You don't, maybe don't have the funding to do this or you can, you first of all have to prove that there is, there could be some return of investment for, for focusing your hours or um, getting resources to do this. But if you have the opportunity to do this, you, you use this to identify user needs and activities. And this is a picture for one of, one of the uh, possible so, uh, providers of this solution to, to, uh, to structure your uh, street, your usage data from the streets and the curbs. And also structuring what, as I said earlier, what you have, which functions do you have, and where do you have? And there are a number of initiatives here. There's one. This one is from an open street picture, uh, so that you also can uh, work with open data. And doing this also, then you you actually code the curb, as I said before. And next step would be to unlock and gain access to data that is already being collected because most cities they sit on a, on, on a large pile of of data and sometimes i don't wouldn't say that you you know aware of it but you actually do and you have different system if if you have you have meters you have data from them of course um you have some called kind of smartphone park, park, parking application and there's a lot of data there, but usually these applications are mostly be developed or procured only for the reason of uh, managing transactions, not for um, traffic parking, curbside management. And then there are other other source of data. I mean, you have some some sort of system for um, for managing citations, violations, and these of course useful indicators in seeing okay. We have to maybe we should do something here and you have also the last bullet point here you should also connect these data because they are usually in different different systems different passwords credentials and with sits with different persons as well and there are uh, a number of students who have who work with this you you, you work with open ipas and trying to uh, connect all the dots And then the the last uh, 
slide with solutions. So it says collaborate and do pilots. And collaborate, you should do openly with both other agencies internally, other cities, because I feel like a number of cities, you, you are too small and you maybe you don't have the power or resources to do all this on your own. I mean, there's there's examples of different cities who actually have or or districts having their own research department. And it would be, of course, nice for every city to have that, but that's maybe not possible. So collaborate with other cities would be good. I see that the North American NACTO, what, how do you spell that? North American Association of City Transportation Officials, they are uh, and, and maybe an, a good example here in this respect, issuing report white papers on, on what to think about how to do stuff. And this I would like to see more of. And you should also invite, uh, of course, the, the, the providers of both solution and technologies and the end users, different organizations, maybe the goods association, trade associations, and also the, 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 the man on the street. Doing pilots, from that you can evaluate, adapt, and learn. I would say that this is the only way forward to, to build knowledge here. Uh, you can have a sense of, of doing stuff that it would be effective and have a, have a potentially a, a, a good effect and benefits. Uh, and you will mostly be right, but you can't prove it if you haven't done it. And when you do pilots, you also, as I said earlier, you have to, it's really, really hard to, to uh, identify the unwanted uh, behavior uh, or consequences. And it's only by piloting stuff you, you can actually identify that. And you should, of course, make use of existing and new standards. There is a number of initiatives within our field now. There is an initiative to, to develop an ISO standard for, for, um, for operating vehicles and devices at the curb. There are another, uh, well, there's a number of initiatives in this field that are trying to and also in all, both on, on, on national levels and international levels. And there's also EU projects focusing on, on data and data standards and product communication protocols, which I think could be really, really useful for, for us. And here's my final messages. One, there's no piece of technology or solution that will solve all your barriers or fit all your needs. And I think it's important to highlight in this because in my talks with at least Swedish cities, there is sometimes a stress that you, you feel stressed because they are, you as a city official maybe might be approached by a number of providers saying that, okay, these are all the potentials we have with these fantastic solutions. Why don't you try it? And there are so much out there, so many possible sensing technologies uh, that you could throw away your money on. Sometimes, of course, it will be useful, but you have to really focus and you have to be clear what, what your needs are. And you can't expect that that there's only technology or, and that our own solution will, will, will do everything here. The second message is that the entry points for working with curbside management are many. And the most important bit I would say here, we would say here is that you as a city, you start looking at your curb and the data it generates, generates as an asset. If you, for example, develop your own applications, you will have this data automatically, maybe, but if you acquire it, you will have to include the, that as a demand in the, in the tender. And that's really important here, to control uh, your, the data you already, already own, I would say. Okay, thank you for your attendance. And I think, I don't know if we have, no, we don't have much time for, for questions, I realize, but there might be a number of comments that you can, of course, send to us. And we are also available by mail. You can see my email here in the presentation, and I would be happy to, to answer them and collect them um, after this session here and, and also later on in the sessions later today. So thank you very much.